this, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. What's up, peeps? Welcome back to Rebranding Safety. It's that time again. It's time for a new quarterly co-host. Let's jump into the intro and I shall tell you some more about what we're talking all about this quarter. Let's go. The problem in safety isn't deviation, it's complexity. Health and safety has gone mad. Health and safety is trying to unpick having gone mad in the past. There's no one solution or one problem. The problem is that we are looking for one solution. Does the structure of the team allow them to flourish? Feel safe enough to be uncomfortable. The environment defines our behaviors. People aren't the problem, they're the solution. Rebranding safety. Crushing a stereotype. Brought to you by Risk Blue. Well, what's up, peeps? Welcome back to Rebounding Safety. Rebounding Safety is a YouTube channel and podcast doing exactly what it says on the chin. So if you're new here, hit that subscribe button and the bell and all of those magical algorithm me thingamajiggies. My name is James McPherson from the company Risk Fluent Limited. We are your host today. And our guest, our new quarterly co-host is the amazing Tom Geraghty, who's a psychological safety expert so we are going to do three episodes quarterly co-host styly one episode end of the month end of the month of each quarter end of each month of the quarter there we go and we're going to be getting into psychological safety it's a massive massive it's a massive part of what we do and it, but it, it still feels quite new and when I kind of come across Tom which was through local networking um, I was like we need to talk to you we need to get you on we need to let people know kind of really where the, where psychological safety came from maybe dispel some myths maybe make some corrections maybe let people know about disasters and so on um so here is episode one i'm not going to introduce tom because he does a much better job of introducing himself so let's jump into the podcast tom welcome to the podcast mate thanks so much for having me hey no worries mate. thank you very much for coming on um do you want to give a little introduction to yourself first and then we'll, we'll get into it yeah, thanks, thanks. We'll do. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so my name's Tom, Tom Geraghty. Uh, I'm the founder, the creator of a website called psychsafety.com. Um, I've got like a couple of decades experience in mostly in tech leadership and, and sort of managing leading tech teams and, and stuff like that. Um, more recently focused on sort of organizational transformation and organizational dynamics. But my my pet um my 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 mastermind subject, if you like, uh, I guess, is is psychological safety and safety cultures, and that's the thing I'm really really passionate about. And yeah, that's uh, that's that's um that's what I do for a living now. Yeah. So I connected to you through through Gemma, who I know does some work with with yourselves, mm-hmm. and she's mentioned a couple of times um in like this networking group that we both go to um that it's hard for her to really like nail down specific customers she said i've got customers that do this and then and she said, i got customers that work in psychological safety and i can see the room just being like what is that <laughs> and obviously they're like i know exactly what it is <laughs> i think <laughs> yeah um, but we're going to um, do kind of a quarterly co-host. So we're going to go through three episodes. Um, and today, do you want to just give us a summary of kind of what you wanted to kick us off with? And today, like the idea of what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, yeah. So that's brilliant. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to all of these. I think it's going to be super fun. Uh, the So, yeah, I, I think it's really important to like lay down essentially what we're talking about when we when we talk about psychological safety. It's it's a it's a term, it's a phrase that, that more and more people are hearing about it's it's you know you're hearing it kicking about the workplace whether you're in safety you know health and safety or 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 technology or 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 aviation or whatever we're starting to hear this phrase more and more often and which means which is great but it also means that there's a lot more tendency for it to be interpreted a bit maybe not in not not the way it was originally intended not the way the sort of official definition is so, so if we sort of lay that out, then uh, I think that'd be really valuable. So, the term psychological safety itself, I think, was, uh, as far as I'm aware of, anyway, um, first coined in the 1960s by two guys called Edgar Schein and Warren Bennis. They were talking about organizational change, uh, and then um, not a lot happened really for for a while. And then um, in the 90s, some people started to pick it up. A, a guy called Kahn, uh, William Kahn, I think, started looking at it uh i think he was studying uh summer camp counselors and then and then amy edmondson who is now the sort of the the name the name that most people know of when when, when you think of psychological safety uh she was studying clinical teams 
at um at harvard she's still at harvard she's at harvard business school she and so she was studying clinical teams and i'll, I'll keep this really short but uh, maybe we can dive into this in a minute but what she was looking at as clinical teams and what she found was that high performing clinical teams in this context were admitting more mistakes uh admitting their mistakes uh, uh whereas low performing clinical teams were, were hiding theirs and of course this all starts to make sense because this ability to 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 admit and talk about and address mistakes and co- continuously improve was how those teams got to got to high performing and the low performing teams kind of got stuck in this this uh, uh, cycle of keep making making the same mistakes over and over again and so through amy's research she kind of definition of psychological safety that it is the belief that one will not be punished or or humiliated for speaking up with ideas questions concerns or mistakes and that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking Mm. um and and i think and in fact that's a really powerful uh definition because it raises these 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 four things these ideas questions concerns or mistakes and in fact if we only remember those four things then we're pretty good yeah that's Psychological safety in a nutshell. I uh, I'm glad that we kind of wanted. I think when we when we both kind of first got into to talking about this, and I knew guy coming on the podcast, and we were like, you're one of the. I was quite clear in that I wanted to know if I've interpreted it correctly right. as to what it was originally intended because there was part of me that was like kind of what you alluded to um in a much nicer way than i might in that i see a lot of stuff out on linkedin and i'm like i'm no psychological safety kind of expert but even though i think that's complete bullshit what you've just said and yeah. I'm like, i think a lot of people are really kind of missed it and, and i think there's kind of like a trade-off isn't there when things become popularized it's really good that everybody's talking about it but it also the trade-off is that it becomes a bit diluted um Mm -hmm. and and i can kind of see why because i think this if we were to like if you were to i find it i find it quite funny and that particularly in safety one of the things that gets demonized quite a lot in more mature safety is like oversimplification. Mm-hmm. So, and I think safe psychological safety has suffered from that a little bit. Um, but ultimately, if you look into like nudge theory, simplification is a nudge. So yeah. it's like, if you want to nudge people to get something, you've got to simplify it, but then don't simplify it too much because then you dilute it. And and I, as a practitioner who basically my job is to read all of this stuff, keep an eye on all of the stuff that's happening and how we can improve and then take that to my customers who are doers you know they're people that run businesses and and they're doing the do i have to simplify it and i find it's a real hard thing to balance that is is that oversimplification and and simplification and good simplification if that makes sense yeah yeah completely and in fact there's there's a there's a there's a term for, for what you just described which is semantic diffusion which is a term coined, I think, coined maybe by someone else, but but from from my knowledge, it's coined by Martin Fowler, who was talking about the term DevOps and technology. And some of the most, and I think this is why psychological safety has really sort of touched um, uh, the 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 sort of industry and, and like made it such a connection because because it is fundamentally it feels rather simple, and we we inst- we almost instinctively we get it, we get what it feels like to be like to be on a team and feel psychologically safe we don't we almost we, we don't need all the definitions and research we instinctively we get it to a degree there is a danger that we oversimplify it and it and it begins to turn into this sort of um wellness kind of mm. um, like faddy kind of like mental like men it, it's often connected to mental health it's often connected yep. to wellness. and yes it is it is related to those things but I think it's kind of doing it a disservice to to say, oh, it's it's like just a just a thing to do with mental health, or it's just a thing to do with wellness at work. No, it's it's like it's the foundation of all performance and innovation and avoidance of error or, or mitigating error and 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 improving and 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 developing from error and everything else. Like it's Deming knew this back decades ago. Like yeah. it is the foundation. He, you know, he he said drive out fear so that everyone may work effectively for the company. He knew that the 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 the, the presence of psychological safety. He didn't use the term, but he he knew that the the presence of fear 
would calcify and chill an organization to to a point at which which they could no longer do anything and mm. yeah that's my experience as well i find this i'm gonna go, go a little bit down a rabbit hole because i find this is a really a uh, challenging mm. balance i i find for for me myself but also our customers um other professionals practitioners that we talk to this kind of and you touched on it what you said about deming and fear and and kind of blame and stuff like within an organization and having psychological safety and this whole like this this balance between the two in the what we might call blame is accountability. So people being accountable for their errors and, 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 and employers being able to kind of hold someone to account. And, and you don't, if you're running a business, you don't want to be like, Oh, it's just willy nilly, do whatever you want. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. you've got to set a standard, right? So as a company, yeah. you're trying to deliver a consistent quality product. You're trying to make sure that people do stuff, you know, in a certain way. Um, And, and that, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's good business. I mean, yeah. I, go, I stay in a Premier Inn because I know it's exactly the same every time I go there. Like, yeah. So if you're at Premier Inn, you want your employees to be accountable to, for delivering that standard. But then there's this whole notion, I think, where we've gone, particularly the practitioners have gone, like we're seeing stuff now like no blame and stuff because mm-hmm. they've gone and gone, oh, if we, if we blame people, it introduces a fear of being blamed and then reduces their likelihood to speak up therefore impacting uh implant sorry reducing psychological safety um and this whole balance of how to what it looks like in reality is really hard i find yeah yeah it is really hard it is really hard and and actually if we get if we get into the sort of meat of it like we we if we actually begin to work with psychological safety what it really means is yeah it doesn't mean the absence of accountability or the absence of standards in in fact it means in practice really it means the ability to hold ourselves and and our other team members to even higher and higher standards mm. um without fear that we're that, that we're going to break up the team or sort of be be, be accused of being a, being a nitpicker or something like that yeah. um it, it, the the presence of psychological safety on a team means that we can say oh it, uh, you know someone produces uh, I don't know produces a report or something then then uh, if we feel psychologically safe we feel psychologically safe to point out improvements mistakes uh or challenge even you know the the, the message of the report or, or something for example we 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 can continuously improve each other and ourselves because we feel psychologically safe to do so it doesn't mean the absence of uh yeah it doesn't like, like I said it doesn't mean just being willy-nilly and just going oh yeah well that went wrong but no one's to blame so yeah 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 I find that that's a common struggle for I think even even for for us with our customers like it's still it's still a struggle trying to balance this world of of holding people to account, which I know some people don't like, and then also this pr- promoting psychological safety, but then also it not just being like you know a complete free world to just do what you want, which you, which you can't do. And I think people struggle with the notion. I think that's the first thing where this falls down. And and ironically, I think we did exactly the same thing as to what we what we're critical about is that we oversimplified even the notion of blame. We've yeah. oversimplified that to go, oh let's do it. Let's but we're a no blame company. And I'm like that's that's just as stupid as like half of the stuff that you bad mouth like zero harm, for example. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly, exactly. I, I think, <clears throat> I think, um, I think it's re- it's important to recognise that we cannot be blameless. Like we, not only does blameless lead just like a, a, a strive to completely blameless lead to quite strange places or difficult places where, where maybe we feel like we can't, we can't investigate the the causes of problems, mm. lest we inadvertently find that someone was at fault whatever that fault was um but also we're we're you know we're, we're fundamentally kind of primitive humans and we're we're kind of we're we're coded to to yeah. find blame and point blame and find smoking guns and and stuff like that so so better a better approach really is to is to be consciously blame aware and yeah. like recognize when we are leaning towards blaming something or someone and and try and 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 recognize and go oh we're you know we're 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 leaning towards blaming this person for doing this thing and naturally you know human error 
like human error shouldn't be the end of investigations it should be the start of investigations yeah. this is kind of the whole safety two paradigm and everything um y- you could argue there's no such thing as human error we could that's a debate worth having probably but um but well, there's another <laughs> three episodes in it so. <laughs> yeah yeah right. yeah but yeah like being blame aware is much more powerful than being than trying to be blameless i think I, f- I find it fascinating, that, and, and I've kind of done it myself here, in that um, the reason why I find this conversation comes up every time we start talking about becoming more mature, increasing performance within teams, and therefore increasing psychological safety and so on, the conversation normally always, the mindset, I don't know whether it's just maybe British culture or, or, or what, but always ends up going to after the fact of something's gone wrong. Whereas mm-hmm. I find psychological safety for me is is like, why are we not talking about the bit before something goes wrong, which is where psychological safety for me comes into its own and somebody saying we got a problem here before yeah. it becomes a problem, if that makes sense. Completely, completely. I I often talk about how psychological safety is the precursor. It's the it's the foundation, it's the it's the necessary environment in which safety can can occur. Because Safety is kind of a, just like psychological safety. Safety is a weird thing to measure, right? Because it's the absence of things going wrong. It's the absence of, of something. So, and psychological safety is the absence of the fear of being punished or humiliated. So, yeah. it's, it's kind of hard to measure the absence of of something, right? So, yeah. but but psychological safety itself, and if this, it's it's almost it's almost a priori true that if we want there to be fewer mistakes fewer risks fewer dangers um then we need to create an environment in which people can point out those mistakes even if they're their own <clears throat> and this is really important even if they're their own or even if they've even if they might suffer some sort of interpersonal risk as a result of pointing it out um or you know the extreme end of, of that is whistleblowing but 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 and, and we and we sort of hear about that every now and then uh, in the NHS and other organisations, but actually, at the the far more common end of that is just the pointing out of of that um, that railings uh, a, a bit broken, or or um, you know, or that you know, some job that someone did six months ago actually needs redoing. And but you but that that person was you know your mate, and mm. so do you point it out or do you not point it out? Because yeah, yeah. it kind of could be done better. It could be improved and that would make the, make the world safety, make, make the, make the world of work safer. But at the same time, you kind of pointed out that, that Bob, your mate kind of messed up that job a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's like socially, it's like a socially wicked problem in a way, isn't it? Mm. It's a really hard thing for us to deal with. Um, I'm mean, I think I went down a couple of rabbit holes there, so I'm very aware I want to kind of rein it in a bit more because there's loads of names we've mentioned yeah. now already. Um, so, I mean, just as Shine, Edmondson, Deming, like, could you kind of, you, you, I think a lot of us think that Amy Edmondson is, you know, the mother of, of psychological yeah. safety when clearly she is and in, what, in kind of what you said. So it, it would be kind of really helpful, I think, go back through that little timeline you went through earlier and maybe just kind of refreshing us or maybe even introducing us into some of these key names. Yeah, good shout, good shout. And I'm, uh, so I, I <clears throat> timeline wise, I'm definitely going to get this wrong, but, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but let's, let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's think about that. So, yeah, like back, back in the, I think it was the sixties. Edgar Schein, Warren Ben is looking at organizational change, and they literally just mentioned psychological safety as a. I think it was maybe was just once, maybe twice in in the entire book. Um, following on from that, I think it's quite interesting that through the second half of the of the twentieth century, uh, yeah, people like Deming talked about driving out fear. Uh, yeah, driving out fear so that everyone may work effectively for the company. He also talked about. I think that I think the phrase is um. Where there is fear, you will find wrong figures. Mm. And he was making this point that where people are afraid of of punishment for for performance or sort of not hitting not hitting met, metric targets, the the figures will get massaged or, or or maybe tweaked or just you know even if it's subconsciously they will end up in the wrong figures. So Deming Deming knew this when Taichi Ono was 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 designing the Toyota production system in kind of conjunction with Deming, uh, 
he was designing a system that was a socio-technical system. He wasn't just designing a factory production line like Taylor and, and, and Ford. He was designing a system that included people and he was taking into account the psychology of people. And there's, there's some really interesting aspects to that. And so Taichi Ono would, would be very much a kind of proponent of, of psychological safety and safety cultures. Um, if we just, quickly, Tom, on, I just summarize socio-technical system, just uh, yeah. some of the listeners don't know what that is. Good shout, good shout. So yeah, so, <clears throat> so we have systems, we have technical systems and that might be a, a factory production line, uh, uh, you know, some sort of robot or machine or, or a software system. That's a technical system. We have social systems that are like communities, groups, schools, you know, groups of people. Uh, and we have socio-technical systems. And this is the, the recognition, the acknowledgement that most technical systems and most social systems actually interact together. A plane, for example, a plane or a submarine, uh, I often use the example of a submarine is a socio-technical system. It's a system made of people and technology working together, people creating and designing and manipulating the technology, but also the technology influencing and um, and determining how people work and interact with it. So it's kind of a cycle. It's a feedback loop, people and technology influencing and working with each other. So we, yeah. we can't we, we can't take them apart. But you yeah. know, we can't we can't pretend that one exists without the other. Mm. Yeah. Yeah I, yeah, I think for for me when I come across that when I was first introduced into that kind of notion of a, a socio technical system, it was quite enlightening for me personally just to be like, oh yeah, of course there is both social and technical aspects yeah. to to the majority of what we do. If you took a construction project, there are technical parts of that job that we that we're doing the brick lays this way and the systems or the process is this and so on and so forth. The regs are this and but to do that job you need people and therefore there comes the social aspect of it. Yeah, yeah, completely, completely. And this is where you get into all the fields of ergonomics and human factors and everything are really, really interesting and linked very much to safety cultures and psychological safety. Um, because because we have to recognize that that people people are flawed. We, you know, the 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 most incredible experts in the world carrying the same task that they're very, very good at over and over again will create will, will execute that task with variability and won't 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 complete it to the same standard every single time yeah and so if yeah and people who create or when we create technical systems we might believe in this perfect operator this perfect person who just carries out the instructions perfectly every single time they do it and of course that's completely flawed yeah yeah um, so we got yeah. to active people yeah Demin and i'm not going to try and pronounce his name because i've never been able to but the toyota guy <laughs> yeah taichi ono yeah. Well done. I'm impressed yeah. that you can do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then and then we the, the list is probably almost infinite because it sort of spans out uh, everywhere into the business world as well. But so yeah, so you've got you've got Amy Edmondson who I think did an amazing job of um, well actually so so her her clinical research into teams was really in 1999, and um, that that was incredible work and, and she did she she wrote some great papers after that but it was it wasn't until google's project aristotle in 2013 that psychological safety began to be sort of noticed by the by the by the business world rather than just the academic world and um, then amy edmondson wrote her book the fearless organization and that was either 2015 or 2016 i really should know that um but it was that it was it was that that was the catalyst that was the you know, I think Amy and others had had laid the foundation, sort of set the fire, set the kindling, and it was the book, Amy Edmondson's book, that kind of lit that fire, and 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 it took off from there. Um, since then, well, not since then, but in addition to that, I think we've got people like Eric Eric Holnagel in the safety world. We've got David Woods, uh, resilience engineering, and the same, same sort of field. We've got Sydney Decker in human error. Uh, we've got um, people like David Marquet of the of the submarine i don't know if you've read turn the ship around which is a great book about i haven't actually it's on my to to read list which is oh. ever growing <laughs> yeah fantastic book definitely worth reading and whilst again whilst whilst david doesn't i don't think he ever uses the word psychological safety the words psychological safety but he but essentially what he did was create psychological safety on the submarine 
mm. um, through a bunch of practices that we can take out of submarine and 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 use in in, in our context. Um, then we've got uh, we've got people like Tim Clark who wrote a book called The Four Stages of Psychological Safety, which yeah. uh, the, the model itself receives quite a lot of criticism, but it is a useful model. I do think it's a useful model to help us understand that psychological safety is different manifestations different dynamics it, we might it's not just this kind of you feel safe or you don't kind of yeah. phenomenon um and um uh yeah and then we've got people like Brené Brown and Kim Scott and people yeah. like that who are sort of t- talking more about the social more about the psychology and social and sociological aspects um of, of leadership and, and people but but definitely like addressing some really valuable stuff in the field yeah mm. I um I think there's one thing to pull out of kind of of what you have kind of gone through all of these people and, and now it's like you've had like a a bit of a line that's been like semi semi kind of flat line with like quite a nice little timeline of people like that have touched on this process of psychological safety and then it's as it's received its boom it's kind of split off into loads of different industries mm-hmm. all of which are utilizing the concept or variations of it in their own way um and, and i find like i don't know how aware you are of the the safety profession that that i am part of um for for my sins and that we uh we're addicted to tribalism and it, and it and i'll probably mm-hmm. touch on this a bit too much in my in in the podcast but it, it does frustrate me a lot in that we seem to have very much gone like this one academic is the way to do absolutely everything or this collection of two or three academics is the way to do everything. But I found it really interesting how you kind of said, oh, you've got like Decker um, who kind of is is in human error, for example. I know he touches on ethics quite a bit sometimes. Um, You've got David Woods, like you're saying, resilience engineering, um, Honagel probably as well, safety two, resilience kind of engineering. But ultimately, like I think my opinion is where practitioners should be thinking about this is kind of how you've summarized it um, in that there are loads of different things that we can pull lots of bits of, of out, out of. Like we look at how they utilize it in a submarine and we can go, hmm, do you know what? I'm going to try that in my my wind farm, for example, and yes. see how that works. Yeah. And then go, yeah, this thing here didn't work, but this did. And then this over here in the sports team example, that also worked really well. Like for, that's what do you think about that? That's yes. how I try to approach it. Yeah, completely, completely. And that's and and to be honest, that's what kind of keeps me going in this field like and it's what keeps me interested in, and enthusiastic about it because there are so many different examples and, and applications and contexts you know that we can take the andon cord from the toyota production system and and take it and go to a technology team or a healthcare team and say you know and we can talk about the andon cord and how toyota use it but then they can implement their own version their own context yeah, yeah. and and that's what's so powerful we can we can and it's what I enjoy doing. We can we can cross pollinate from different industries and different different um different researchers in different fields. And what's 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 really interesting? Yeah. So in fact, so yeah, you you talked about sort of the submarine. You talked about sports teams. And what what works in one context doesn't necessarily work in another. Like in the military, the military is incredibly hierarchical, ordered, yeah. and and structured, right? Um. And it's, it's, it's probably the most hierarchical organization or type of organization on the planet. Yeah. And in, but, but we talk about we, the, the military, the, the US Navy, the US Army, the U, uh, UK um, armed forces address and talk about psychological safety in real, in powerful terms, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a context that is, this is really important for us. This is the foundation of all that we do. We, we we need to build and foster psychological safety in our squadrons, in our units, in order to execute the the very difficult things that we're required to do. And that and, and in their context, the hierarchy, the structure actually helps foster psychological safety. Mm. It helps people who are who have a job to do understand the parameters, the boundaries of their responsibility, their, their decision making. Uh, limits and things like that. It, 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 you know the the the, um, the principle of um, uh, mission command in the military actually helps foster psychological safety by setting the parameters for decision making in the field. Yeah. In a different organization, 
hierarchy can be a real it can be can be incredibly damaging for psychological yeah. safety that just that that those those layers of management you have to go through to get anything done and 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 the bureaucracy involved and the and the the, the layers of authority and the and the sort of the the quite tailoristic sort of um being told what to do rather than being empowered uh that can be quite damaging in those organizations so my point really is that yes we can take these different lessons from different contexts but we have to recognize that not every context not not every application fits you know there is no one size fits all yeah. and i think where we get into the sort of problems with tri- with tribalism and saying ah oh, well it's you know we've, we we must always you know take a safety two approach well yeah like that's good but sometimes you need a safety one approach as well and sometimes you need this approach and sometimes you need that I, I find it fascinating that, like, that, that I just can't, I can never give a serious response if anyone does say to me, like, oh, you know, and it's, it, I, will, I will say it's less so now. It, but, but, like, when I started right. rebranding safety, what, four, four or five years ago, it was very much like, are you safety one or are you safety two? And I was like, yeah. are you joking? Like, the book actually says and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it says and. It doesn't say, it says and. Like, yeah. like I'm not very good at English, but I'm pretty sure that means both. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, so I, I'm quite, the, I mean, we've got, we've got like two more episodes, so we're going to go into this a yeah. hell of a lot more um, depth anyway, and we'll chew the fat on a lot of those points, because I think there is, there's a couple of things that maybe not today, but in one of the other episodes that I'd like to understand or, or at least talk about a little bit more is kind of what you touched on about hierarchies and stuff but also like people having clarity of understanding Mm. this is my role this is my time this is my my expertise you know we talk about deference to expertise a lot in safety like but understanding it's am i the expert is this are you deferring to me and so on and then also motivation to speak up because i go to a lot of businesses where actually they're really psychologically safe, like particularly mm. male dominated environments, a lot yeah. of the shop floor feel real comfortable to speak up and they will tell you, but they're just not motivated to. So that's something I think I'd like to touch on. Um, but maybe we pause that for one and two. And, and I know we yet to kind of really decide how we want to roll those two out, but yeah. in, for today, um, it, for the rest of the, it might, this, this episode, it might be worth, really getting into some introducing psychological safety using some real life kind of disasters and, and catastrophes that have happened. Like, have you got a couple like key ones that really stick out in your mind um, that, that would be really good to kind of introduce the concept using that real life example? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and there are, yeah, uh, really? I kind of love talking about disasters because there are so many, there are just so many to choose from. In fact, in fact, I would argue and I have argued in the past that if you if you look at or find any disaster, anything that's gone wrong in the field of human endeavor, you can probably find somewhere a component cause of a lack of psychological safety somewhere in the somewhere in the in the process. Um, so I use quite a lot just to pick one out of the air. Yeah. So there's two actually I use a lot, uh, primarily because of the availability of content that i could use in workshops and stuff the 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 first example i use is the which i can never remember the year but the the everest um team where a number of them died and they wrote a book and they all fell out was it robert something i can't remember um um so the the, you think about that book into thin air yeah 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 that's it john crack crack no crack crack hour Krakow, yeah, and and the, the in really interesting story in there that there was a pilot in that team that that could read cloud formations but never spoke mm. up. So we knew there was a storm coming but never spoke up. That's that's one example I use quite a lot. Feel free to add some more into that yeah. if you want to. And then yeah. I actually use um, the second one I, I use is and it's, it's slightly, it is dramatized, but from what I can find out, it's it's not too dramatized. Is the the TV, the HBO show Chernobyl, and mm-hmm. the character of Dyatlov. I use mm-hmm. a supercut of him in that show all the time. Just someone who's clipped loads of bits, and not just him, like his bosses, and and then if you understand the context of like the Soviet Union behind that, and and all of this stuff, like I just. That's a fascinating, fascinating yeah. case study. Yeah, and yeah, Chernobyl is a is a is a is a fascinating case study, really, because 
just like you say, the the culture in the Soviet Union at the time, and probably still to this day, is a was maybe still is a very hierarchical. Um, do, do as you're told, obey authority, don't challenge authority, don't speak up, just just do as you're told, comply, compliance culture, and yeah. um, and that so that culture, so we've got that, so that's the socio part, and we've got the technical part, which is the which is the the the, the plant itself, the Chernobyl plant, the RBMK one thousand reactor, and if, if you look at the Ukraine Nuclear Society reports. Of the study, they actually say that the RBMK one thousand reactor is is an inherently unsafe design. It could only be operated in a culture where there, in an environment where there was no safety culture, so it could only be operated unsafely. Uh, and um, so you've you've got those two those two aspects, the socio and the technical. You put them together, we're going to get a disaster. It's going to go wrong. And uh, and of course that's what did happen because they were trying to I think they were trying to run a test to see if they could power the the operations of the plant using spinning down turbines when they're mm. no longer generating power they're just momentum and um and and of course people so the operators felt this was an unsafe thing to do they 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 felt that this was an unsafe not only an unsafe plant but this was an unsafe test but uh either people d- didn't speak up they didn't feel safe to speak up because they'd be reprimanded punished for doing so or or people did speak up, but that message doesn't get passed on. You know, it's, it, this is we can look at other disasters where that where that's the case. But they conducted the test anyway, and of course we know what happened then: a steam explosion, nuclear explosion. I think thirty-one people died. Um, yeah. But yeah, and and fundamentally, those people may not have died if people had felt psychologically safe enough to speak up. Now that's not to say that because there is no such thing as single root cause, but let's not say that a lack of psychological safety was the root cause, but it was a component cause. Yeah. If there had been a culture of psychological safety in in that plant, that disaster may well not have happened. Yeah. And, in, and interesting, I don't know if you've, I assume you've watched the show, the HBO show of Chernobyl. Have you watched it? I actually have not, no. It's it's actually typically that stuff is like really dramatized. Yeah. It's, it's actually not too bad. And then the supporting podcast that they did, where they had the film producer, the the show producer, um, on there, kind of goes through. Essentially, it's a whole podcast of him saying what is dramatized and what's not. Right. And he pretty much goes through and he's like, "That's based on this record. That's based on that record." And nearly the whole show is like quite. And like correct, mm-hmm. which is right. rare, which is rare as fuck, yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah. You, you get yeah. like Deepwater Horizon and Mark Wahlberg like saving the day, <laughs> yeah, like, with his massive muscles. But like this is actually quite. And the only character that's made up um, is is the um, there's a there's a lady in there. There's a female um, scientist. Um, she's a made up character. She actually represents a group of scientists that were trying to get the truth out essentially mm, mm. and try to say you've you've got a big problem here um so she represents a big group and they only did that because um they didn't want to have this massive group of cast of, yeah. of scientists they just summarized it into one person yeah um, but 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 it i mean i'm no chernobyl expert at all um but from what i can understand it seems to be quite to to record the show which is rare yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it's also I, I find it really useful as a practitioner in if I say to if I say to a business owner, for example, is running a, a medium sized business. Oh, go and read this this paper by by Deming. They're like not a chance. But yeah. if I go and say, go and watch the HBO show Chernobyl. And then we'll have a chat about it and we can pick stuff out. That's that's yeah. why I kind of use, uh, use yeah. it quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, completely, completely. And it's, it's exactly why I also I also use the example of the Challenger space shuttle disaster. Yes, yeah. Because that's a that's a fantastic uh example of where it's a it's a slightly different dynamic in terms of psychological safety. Um but yeah, there's a great Netflix documentary about it, really and really factual, really dives into what actually happened, what was actually going on. But uh, again, addresses both the technical, which is the rubber O rings on the on the solid rocket boosters on the side of the rocket. Which um, I think they became brittle at low temperatures, and this was a sort of known problem. 
Um, but the socio side of that, the social side of, of that was that the engineers um so the at the bottom so at the bottom i don't really like using that term but at, at the at the front there were the engineers trying to do the work and but from uh at a commercial level there was incredible commercial and political pressure to launch at that on that date mm-hmm. um and so the the message that was trying to the, the, the engineers were saying this is unsafe was trying to get was, was sort of going through the ranks but not but either just not getting through hitting brick walls or glass ceilings uh, through where people didn't feel safe to report that message back up, reporting concerns, or it got diluted. We sort of see this as a greenwashing effect sometimes in, in projects and stuff in organizations, don't we, where, uh, you know, red turns into an amber, an amber turns into a green. Uh, a project that's all red on the ground gets to the board level, gets to the senior execs, and it's all green on the outside. We also call it the watermelon effect sometimes, don't we? Yep. So um and we see that effect and and this is this is what again part of what caused the challenger disaster you could say you could say the root cause was brittle rubber o-rings you could say the root cause was people not um passing on the message directly and a lack of psychological safety in yeah Yeah. in reality it's more complex yeah an an interesting thing i find with all it i was listening to um I quite like the Joe Rogan podcast. We kind of style our podcast very much on on Joe Rogan, except we don't have the money and it's <laughs> an exclusive deal with Spotify <laughs> or a or a producer that could just Google shit for us. So <laughs> I, have to, I have to Google it myself on my phone. Whilst I'm talking. Um, but there, it's a quite a recent episode um, with it, and um, it was really fascinating. Um, if this automatically plays whilst I'm looking for the episode, I apologise. Um, I just want to get the name of the of the guy. Um, and it was a fascinating discussion because this guy kind of came comes at everything. Peter Zihan, I think I've pronounced that right. So Peter Z E I H A N. It's episode one nine two one. Now this guy has got a geography background. Mm. Um, and something else background like academia and essentially he's like predict shit and is like really good at predicting shit and just put stuff together and anyway it's just it's not really relevant to what we're talking about and there's a reason i'm going to pull it out um but just anyone listening just go and listen to it it's fascinating you want to understand more about you know what's going on right now in russia with ukraine with china with america it, and the economy food shortages all of this stuff it's fascinating to listen to but it, interestingly he touches on he pretty much doesn't say psychological safety but he does give examples of like um, the Chinese government, I can't remember the, the, the name of the leader of the Chinese uh, the mm. China at the moment, but like actively removing cognitive diversity from the room, actively yeah. destructively taking out psychological safety in a way. Um, and, and he basically just outright says China will disappear. What we know mm. China as will disappear on the basis that because this leader He's no longer listening to what some people might call fresh eyes, different opinions and things like that. Um, it will destroy the country. Yeah. And, and that's essentially what we're talking about. But what he also says pretty much all the way through this is we've seen it in history. He says we've seen it through history. Mm-hmm. We've seen it through history. If your country is here, you'll do well. If your country's here, you'll do well, whatever. We've seen it in history. And I was sitting there listening to him and I was thinking, we're all like trying to work out what the one answer to like good, like risk management resilience is like, and I'm just like, we've seen it in history, man. Like it's, it's, it's everywhere. Like history just tells the future, doesn't it? Challenging yeah. Boeing 737. Like, um, was it the max? Was it 737 max? 737 max. Yeah. There's that like, you've got Chernobyl, you've got, just it, it, it fucking the list just goes on three mile island it's just same yeah. shit over and over again one of the yeah and exactly and, and one of the most interesting um one of the most interesting examples i came across recently uh, i think it was yeah it, it, it was last year actually was um the swedish warship the vasa oh, i don't yeah. know if you've heard of this no, so brilliant absolutely brilliant in fact there's a there's a so there's a museum in sweden um in stockholm um to the Vasa and the Vasa is a warship that is in there and you can go and see it and it sank um just outside Stockholm on its maiden voyage in 1628 
Right. And it's a fantastic example of of a lack of psychological safety because the the king at the time I can't remember the name of the king who sort of decreed that this this huge warship be built, um, but he decreed that this huge warship be built and he and he contracted a bunch of people to do it and 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 he kept adding more and more specs and requirements to it like bigger cannons, more cannons, uh, you know you, you need more I don't know just kept adding stuff to it. And changing the design as it was being built, and and the people who were building it were aware that it was that was it was it was flawed, like it was going to sink. It was not a safe design because of the way you can't design a ship and then just just you know keep modifying it all the way through. Yeah. And in fact, there was a, it was like lopsided and all sorts of other stuff as well. Um, and it, yeah, it sank on its maiden voyage, uh, and and you know a bunch of people died. Um, and then because of the because of the sea, there is incredibly incredibly cold. It was preserved uh, really almost almost perfectly for uh, like 350, 400 years almost. Um, and they, 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 they brought it back to the surface uh, 20 or so years ago. And, um, and you can go and have a look at it. And yeah, so it's, a, it's like a 400 year old example of a lack of psychological safety causing a disaster. And you can go and have a look at it. Wow, that's amazing. If you were, if you were gonna, I know what we tried to get you to pick a couple before. I know I'm gonna put you back in that spot. If yeah. you like, the, the majority of the listeners to uh, rebound and safety are like quite mature in the mindset of like safety, risk, resilience, and all. So, most I'd be surprised if, if they hadn't heard of this concept. If you were to try and pick, say, one or two kind of disasters to say, if you if you haven't learned about that one that that would be your go-to kind of example to learn about which, which ones would you would you pick oh, oh that's a question i think um so one one that immediately springs to mind which is a really evocative one is the amagasaki train crash in japan oh, okay Are you familiar with that i've heard the uh, the, the name magasaki yeah. as well but other than that so this this was the high speed train in Japan that that um, came off its rails and went and 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 went into an apartment building because it was it was like high up um, yeah, it was one of these high uh, high yeah. up trains whatever you call those um, and um, the the train company had a very very uh, strict very high performance culture. Uh, but a but a but a but also a culture of punishment, a culture of retribution, a culture of embarrassment, a culture of humiliation if you didn't hit your targets, and had very very tight targets to to achieve. And so, I'll, I'll cut the story short. But basically, the, the the this train driver had already missed some targets in the past, and he'd already been bullied and humiliated for not hitting those those targets of sort of the train has to get into the station at this second and leave at this second. Um. And he'd, I think they they punished and humiliated him by by making him clean toilets, and and all sorts of like, quite nasty stuff. And on this day, something I can't remember what something had made him something had delayed the train, and he knew that he was behind schedule. And because the the punishment for not for for getting behind schedule was, and it got worse every time. So he knew it was it was going to be awful for him if he if he didn't make this target. And he went, just went too fast around the bend and the train just left the tracks and went straight into the apartment building. It was a terrible disaster. Um but and that's a but it's a and it's a it's a horrible disaster, but it's a it's a very visceral, real example of of how a, a, an effort to try to sort of strive for these for these very high performance targets can actually result in in disaster because people will take whatever shortcut necessary to hit that target that driver wasn't a bad train driver um he wasn't a bad person and it, and 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 you could argue that he was to blame but again we're you know getting back to into blame like who's to blame for that you could argue the train driver's to blame or uh, or his managers to blame maybe his managers were told or or, or incentivized to carry out that that sort of humiliative um, behavior as a result of them being told by someone else you know who's where does the chain stop so i think it's a really that, interesting I, example that that ultimately is a really difficult challenge in and an interesting challenge and in, uh, where does the chain stop so i don't know if you've read outliers by malcolm yeah. well this is a fascinating section in there which i 
I can vividly remember listening to as I was driving um, down south, and they were talking about um, he. No, I can't remember what he called it, but it was like an index of countries in how hierarchical they are. Yeah, power and distance. He, Yes, yes. And like even the way they talk to each other um is is like based on like they go go out for dinner and and the people in positions that are societally accepted as high high value or whatever talk first eat first whatever um so if you're in that culture uh, so let's say a cleaner would be classed as quite low down the chain you're not allowed to talk which is just in the western world just sounds like in mm. britain anyway just sounds fucking nuts um mm. but interestingly like when you say that that exam when you go through that example to me that sounds very typical of a kind of asian japanese kind of Chinese kind of culture of like failure results in embarrassment. I'm like, I'm quite a big martial arts geek slash fan. And and mm. that was always how how martial arts was taught for years. Like if you can't do a technique, you get whacked until you yeah. until you do it. Um, yeah. and, and, and a lot of martial arts stems from like Asian cultures. So how far do you go? Because mm. if that manager or that business owner has just built his style of management based off what that culture of that country is, so everybody's managing like that, how far do you go? Well, yeah, and I think this is really fascinating because, <clears throat> yeah, there's and there's a lot you can... Uh, um, in fact, there are some plane crashes that Malcolm Gladwell talks about that that have been attributed to that sort of culture, like um, the Indonesian airlines, yeah. um, you know, speaking to air traffic control. Uh, there was, an, in fact, there was an Air France flight, um, which which had the same sort of dynamics at play. People not speaking up, yeah. uh, and this is and this is where the um, so we we now have the sort of phrase or the 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 the, the approach of uh, CRM, cockpit resource management or crew resource management. Yeah, uh, this idea, which is which is designed to address those sort of cultural challenges. Mm. Now. Of course, you're always sort of straining against the embedded culture of of the region or or, or the or the community, and th- there'll always be these tensions. There'll always be lessons that we have to unlearn, sort of cultural yeah. and sociological and societal lessons that we have to unlearn. What I find really interesting, back to Taichi Ono in the Toyota production system. Now, Taichi Ono, Japanese Japanese car manufacturing, um, uh, after the war. Japanese the Japanese economy was devastated the the country was devastated the, the the factories were devastated they had very very little in terms of infrastructure and 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 even and they had very few people um uh, so they had to they had to do a lot with very little and that was that was sort of part one of Taichi Ono's uh, approach we've got to do we've got to achieve a great thing with very few resources the second thing was he was I understand crucially aware of Japanese hierarchical culture and the sort of uh, the, the sort of obedience kind of culture, compliance sort of culture, and I I kind of feel like that's why he's designed a system, things like the Andon Cord that have that address this head on. That mm-hmm. so when when someone pulls the Andon Cord in the Toyota in a Toyota production factory, they are praised. They are they are thanked. For doing so, because that's a that's an explicit uh, mechanism by which we sort of by 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 which we combat, we're we're addressing we're we're trying to mitigate this impact of uh, of this sort of compliance culture, this hierarchical culture, and yeah. and it was only, maybe it's only by that being so clear and and present that Taiji Ono was able to to recognize oh this if we don't address that it will be a problem. Mm. And maybe that's where that has come from. Yeah, yeah. There's there is part of me that kind of feels sorry for a modern day business in that there's just so much now. There's so much information, isn't there? Like, yeah. and and I and I can kind of understand where some businesses being like, I'm not being funny. Like, how did all these businesses get 
really quite successful and they didn't even know about all of this stuff. They just slapped people about a little bit when they did something they didn't want them to do. And like, I could, I, even I, who I'm, I, I enjoy this stuff. I've I, I just recorded a podcast actually saying how like last year I just stopped listening to podcasts, stopped reading stuff, stopped mm. looking, following academia. Stop, I even stopped really going on LinkedIn. I'm still struggling with LinkedIn a bit now, if I'm honest, yeah. but like, it's it's a bit it's a bit exhausting, isn't it? Trying to keep up with everything that's it going is. on. It is. It really is. It it really is exhausting. And I think <clears throat> there is hmm, there is a real challenge in um, sorting the signal from the noise. Yeah. And and there is a lot more noise than there used to be. There's a lot more people generating content. There's a lot more. Uh, you know, there's inevitably there's more and more content than there ever was. Every day there's more content than there was yesterday. So yeah. you know, it's we, we we do have to sort through it. I, and this is why I think it's really powerful to to kind of come back to the point we were talking about at the start to come back to first principles, come back to the foundations, come back to the basics. And if we if we recognise the need to consider people as part of a system, to 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 recognise the 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 power in in considering and and um, treating people as real, full human beings who 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 should feel they can be themselves at work and 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 not feel under threat or under pressure or or, or, or at risk of being humiliated or or punished for two reasons. Partly because we know that that way leads to better organizational performance we know it leads to better outcomes we know we know it leads to safer outcomes as well as increased innovation and that's what we're trying to achieve yeah but also maybe more importantly is because it's the right thing to do mm. like it's the right moral ethical just thing to do to enable because we spend maybe most of our lives at work and, yeah. and if, we, if we if we don't feel safe to be ourselves if we don't feel safe to be to not put a mask on at work and not sort of pretend to be someone else or or, or, or sort of change ourselves, and then 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 we're doing everyone a disservice. So mm-hmm. so the right the right thing to do is to create a, a psychological a, a foster a culture an environment of psychological safety. Partly because it's the right moral just thing mm-hmm. to do, but also luckily it results in better organisational outcomes. Yeah, I find it fascinating. I like to like. That's a really nice pod clip you've just said there. So we're going to cut that up and uh, and share the shit out of that. I always love it. <laughs> um, that sounds like it's straight out of your keynote. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, I find it fascinating actually. Like to to have psychological safety for me is like this balance of being able to not have this this fear of embarrassment uh, and so on, but. I think also what you have to be very comfortable with is the fact that to bring yourself, you have to accept that some people might not like your yourself. Yeah. yeah. So if I was to come back to the, how I know you, me and Gemma are in a networking group, right? And in this networking group, there are loads of mini groups within this big organization. Mm. And our group is very, um, let's say banterful to use a, like a, a common phrase. Like we like to have a, a, a laugh and so on. There's a trade-off to that. In our group, we tend to convert a lot of our visitors, but ultimately, there are some people that don't like it, yeah. and, and we kind of have to accept that. That like, and what that means, if I go to the group that is less bountiful, I have to accept that they might not like me, and I might not like that group, so that's not really for me. And and I find that fascinating. In this like, in this kind of in organisations now, we're in we're stuck in a place where like we feel we have to be a business for everyone, and therefore we're kind of a business for no one or a culture for no one in a way. What what are your thoughts on on that? So I think I think that's a really interesting point. It's a, it's a quite challenging point as well because I so we sort of touched on this a little bit earlier with with the idea of um so more more homogenous groups and things. And if if there's a, so there's a few points here. And and we're 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 getting into diversity and inclusion, which is which is intrinsically related to psychological safety. And we should definitely address that because, as you just alluded to, so it's it's easier to create psychological safety in a group that is very similar. So in a very homogenous group, if we're all, if we're if if we put together a group of white English speaking middle aged men from London, 
Like they're well, probably gonna... like a fucking horrible group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they're all gonna get on, right? They're all gonna get on. They're, they 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 get each other, they they understand each other, they understand each other's context and 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 um and 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 the more the more we make that group alike, like if we if we if we select it even closer, so they're all from private schools, they're all from a particular part of the country. They, you know, uh, uh, all these different, and then they're all gonna that's they're they're going to feel very psychologically safe because they they can predict psychological safety is so much about predictability, predicting mm-hmm. how your how the group will will react to your behavior. And so, if you if you've got a very very similar very predictable group, quite easy to feel psychologically safe. If you've got a very diverse group um, with people with, with different languages, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different contexts, um, different life experiences, different abilities, different neurodiversities, uh, 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 and, and and everything else in between, um, then that's creating psychological safety in that group is going to be somewhat more challenging. Yeah. However, and this is the crucial point, however, that group, the more diverse group, will ultimately be higher performing will have better outcomes than yeah. the more homogenous group because we'll yeah. have more diverse ideas perspective yeah. better ways of challenging ideas that maybe aren't you know we're, we're better, better ways of perfecting ideas um so more so diverse- with, a, with a with a lack of cognitive diversity psychological safety is easier with yeah. an increased amount of cognitive diversity psychological safety is harder but Without cognitive diversity, psychological safety feels kind of pointless in a way, and because we're completely missing a whole different perspective yeah, on something. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And in fact, there's a lot of research that that shows that if you combine both cognitive diversity and sort of uh, and socioeconomic and other kinds of diversity as well, if you combine that that diversity with psychological safety. It's like a it's like, it's like it's like a multiplier effect. We get we 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 get a team that are incredibly high performing. Um, diversity on its own and psychological safety on its own will not get you to that same that same point. But yeah. it is much harder. It is much harder to do, and we should strive. We should strive to be more inclusive all the time. Um, uh partly again because it's the right thing to do but partly also because we 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 don't always know the aspects the sort of intersectionalities and and privileges and 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 diversities that are within the group we might not yeah. know that someone in the group is trans or someone in the group um is from uh is an orphan or or or, or someone else in the group yeah. is a refugee we we might not know these things um so we should strive to be as inclusive inclusive as possible um, to make sure everyone feels included because it's not always explicit. So yeah, yeah, it's 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 uncomfortable, isn't it? Like, but it, it's yeah, a good. I remember we had um, Doctor Dara Blumenthal on the podcast. God, what like feels like years ago now, um, because she did a lovely like kind of hand drawn kind of flow chart of like if you want psychological safety you need this and if you want this you need this and it, it kind of showed the depth of actually mm. how much it required there but we i think we even got it in the intro of of rebound and safety or the, the kind of generic intro we use and that she said in the podcast i don't think i'll ever forget was it, it's about feeling comfortable to be uncomfortable yes yeah yeah, exactly, exactly that, exactly that. It's 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 about feeling comfortable to be uncomfortable, and it's about working to create an environment where other people feel comfortable in challenging you, or questioning yeah. you, or suggesting ideas to you, or giving you. Imagine, imagine someone in the group needs to give you bad news, or give you news that you don't want to hear. Mm. Have you created the environment in which they feel perfectly comfortable to tell you that? And if you if you can't confidently answer yes, when in fact even if you can confidently answer answer yes, you might be wrong. Um, but that's 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 what you're trying to to get to. Um, one of the ways of doing that, we can get to, into this in another episode, but because maybe we can talk about sort of all the ways to do it. But one of the ways to do it, which yeah. I, I think I heard Amy Edmondson say quite a while ago, was one of the best ways to create psychological safety is to pretend it already exists. Mm, nice, I like that. Act as if it already exists, particularly if you're in a leadership position or position of privilege say like maybe you've been with the company decades or you know much longer than everyone else on the team so you're in a sort of position of privilege through tenure or something else um if you've got that sort of privilege to act like it already exists creates a begins to create a safer space for everyone else to to foster those same behaviors 
Yeah, I like that. We definitely need to get into on, on one of the episodes. It's like, what does this look like? How do you do this kind mm. of stuff? Because I think that is where where some people really struggle. Um, but the, the the what you kind of quote you quoted Amy there, and I find that really interesting. Sounds very similar to like. I think it was Gandhi that said, be the change that you want to see. Yeah. Very similar. Like, yeah. and, and I often say to like businesses that we work with, like, look, look, someone's got to go first. There's yeah. always someone who's got to go yeah, first. Yeah. Yeah. Always. And and in an organization, the person with the power and the security is the top of the organization. You have the power, you have all of the safety in a way. Like you're the no one no one's really going to challenge you, especially if you don't have psychological safety within your organization. So you kind of have to go first. And yeah. if you go first, then everyone else will come with you and i find in yeah. safety we all all i mean i mean even worked with organizations that have said like why would i invest in in people's safety when they're not even wearing their pp and i'm like mate because it's not as simple as that unfortunately mm. someone's got to go first and if you want to do i think if you want to do it at least have a quicker impact if the top goes first it's always going to be more powerful i think yeah yeah absolutely and and, and in fact in fact not wearing ppe is really 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 sort of really almost obvious example of of where we're missing a trick with psychological safety and we often we so often see uh work sites uh construction sites and other places where people aren't wearing ppe for example and 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 i almost guarantee that if you see like a bunch of people and, and some of them you know and a load of people aren't wearing their helmets aren't wearing goggles whatever some of them some of them at least some of them maybe all of them are probably thinking Do you know what? i kind of want to, i want to put my my hard hat on i want to put my goggles on i want to put my gloves on i want to put my high vis on but i'm conscious that someone on the group is going to say something if i do yeah yeah which well I, this is fascinating because I, I definitely want to get this in our notes for to talk about but where where does banter sit and and, and what how does that impact psychological say because that kind of what we're touching on oh, here yeah and i think that's fascinating like i want to put my hard hat on because i don't want to die but no one else is. No, yeah. and I'm a safety professional. Even I suffer from that sometimes. I I walk past a sign it says mandatory hearing protection. I know I should do it. No one else is doing it, and I'm like, there's like this battle in my head of yeah. like this social two sides of me that are like I want to conform to the crowd. Yeah. But then I also need to lead by example because I'm the safety guy. And then I also am very aware of the fact that somebody's put that sign there for a reason. And I don't want to be more deaf than I already am. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, and I love that you've just you've just talked about conformity as well. Because I, I remember, oh, I mean, this is back. I, I was at school and I think we did a little lesson. And I don't I wouldn't actually suggest that. I'm not I'm not sure this is a great approach, to, but but it, but it's but it but it, it stuck with me where. Someone was sent out, some kid was sent out of the room, sent out of the classroom for five minutes or something. And, and the rest of the class, we all, we all agreed to that, that this is what we would do. And the, and the teacher said, um, when, when, when Bob comes back in, we're going to ask Bob what five times five is. And, but we're going to insist that five times five is 20. And he's going to, and he's going to comply and he's going to conform. And so, we you know um, bob comes back in we start doing our times tables and and everyone says five times five is 20 and bob's like hmm and then we ask bob what's five times five and bob says 20 knowing knowing it's wrong it's it's definitively wrong but the need to comply the need to conform is so strong so Mm. strong in the group that we will do something that was do and state something that is completely known to be wrong just to conform with the group. Yeah. And that's so powerful. And yeah, yeah it comes back to safety and PPE and everything that we're talking about with psychological safety. Yeah. Yeah. I I I could talk about this all day, but both of us have got real jobs to do. <laughs> um, but like I, I always find I don't know why I might be a bit geeky with this stuff. I, I quite I, I love watching films and TV shows and stuff. So I I tend to like gravitate towards visual uh, and audible kind of content a lot more. I struggle to sit down and read a paper and stuff. That's hard mm-hmm. work for me. So mm-hmm. I tend to do it, but I do find a lot of like, I find like films, even fictional films, fictional drama and stuff like that. It's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever heard the the phrase, uh, I can't remember who 
who said it, uh, but they quote it in Thor uh, in the Avengers as well. Well, like science fiction is just a precursor to to science. Yeah. So like if someone making up some random bullshit about lightsabers or whatever, it just prom- it prompts somebody to think, hmm, I could make that. And then eventually yeah. it just becomes science, right? Yeah. And I find that normal films, you were to watch, a, I don't know, Game of Thrones, for example, it's an exaggeration of real life. So if you imagine the Lannister family as an organization and the Stark family as an organization, you can start to see pros and cons of what you would want to see. It's just an exaggeration of normal life. Um, And I always find like, if people can make this up and put it in a book and in a film, like it's come from somewhere and it's in your organization probably. Yeah, yeah, completely, completely, completely. And, and, and we see those sorts of dynamics in organizations, you know, and, and, and we see the sort of, and and I think back to I think you meant you you, you mentioned something a while back about sort of the the sort of instinctively we can, we 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 can we we so we can run teams and organizations in the the old way you know the yeah. tailor is sort of punishment for mistakes and and sort of um, crack the whip and do as you're told kind of way and we will get short term results we will get short term good outcomes. But we'll only but they'll be short term. The problem is actually a lot of the time that we're only looking at the short term. Yeah, yeah. We only ever measure the short term. Yeah, yeah. Companies, teams ex- might only exist for six months, a year, two years. And we look at that and go, well, that was a success. How did they do that? Oh, well, they they whipped everyone who made a mistake. Well, then we should probably do that over here. But but for long term outcomes, and we're, and and as humans, we're not as good at thinking in long term. Because uh, we're not good at thinking in complex socio technical systems, we 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 always don't come back to the simplistic in the short term, yeah. and that's where we begin to fall down. Yeah. yeah, I think Daniel Pink covers that quite well in his work, and his yeah. book is quite an easy read for yeah. for for. I can't remember what that's called. What, um... We talked about motivation, but yes, I can't remember what the book is called. It's got a simple like one word. Anyway, drive, drive. Drive, yeah, that that's a that's a easy read for anyone, you know. Even if you're, if if you're not, really, you're like, well, I'm not going to read Deming and all of this stuff. Like, yeah. Drive is such a simple, easy read, and it, and it's full of like real good snippets of like scientific research where they show you that, you know, carrot and stick doesn't yeah. work. You got to set yeah. that that base level. Obviously, we need to pay people. I find talking about mis misinterpretations of like what people are saying. We've we kind of touched on that in Amy's work, but like the amount of people that I've I say, oh yeah, I've read Daniel's work. I really like that. I'm just not paying anyone and just making sure they get they find flow. And I'm like, no, that's not what he says. What yeah. he says is you just set a base level of a fair salary and yeah. then find flow. Like, like yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, and in fact, you know, and even that idea isn't new. Like Deming, Deming was suggesting the same thing decades ago in saying yeah. that we should get rid of incentive programs, we should get rid of bonuses, um, because once once we provide people with a with a comfortable living, so that they don't need to, so when they're at work, they're not worrying about money, mm. you know, that they're able to live a comfortable life and have leisure time and, and and everything else, then the vast majority of people actually just want to get meaning and, and satisfaction from their work. And actually, mm. the provision of incentives and metrics and bonuses distort distort work, and in fact, a lot of the time can damage work and damage outcomes because we find we're incentivizing the thing that we actually didn't want to incentivize, or we 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 find there's some inadvertent, un, unintended consequence of incentivizing this thing over this thing. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, mate, I think we we've gone all over the shop on a on a. <laughs> a messy introduction into into psychological <laughs> data but i think we covered quite a lot there and kind of some important names some good examples of kind of disasters um i, I think starting off with a good definition i think it was really it was really important but i think we'll get into over the next mm. two episodes maybe a bit more a bit more chunk um, yeah. And then, and then also a bit more of like what this actually looks like in reality and how it works um but before we get to there mate like let us know about your company, what you do, and if people are like, I need some help with this stuff, and they want to talk to you more, how how can they do that? Brilliant, thanks. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and well, thanks for having me on. I'm really enjoying this. It's fantastic. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. If anyone wants to get in touch, head over to psychsafety.com, uh, and uh, there's a whole bunch of resources there. So there's a bunch of free resources. So if you just want to like learn more about it, um, download some templates, some some workshop ideas, some just learn more. There's a whole bunch of free stuff on there. Uh, there's also a downloadable toolkit 
There's a community, an online community that you can join uh, to share uh, and learn from other folks in the field. There's a weekly newsletter that I, I fire out, so you can you can sign up to that. And uh, uh, what else we've got? We've got regular meetups, uh, and you can sign up to training courses, open enrollment workshops, and stuff like that. You can also just get in touch with me to find out if there's, well, to, if you're interested in me working, or us working with your organization, your teams, and doing some other doing some other like long-term program, transformation program kind of, kind of work with the organization. But yeah, head over to psychsafety.com and it's it's all there. Yeah, there's loads of value on your website, mate, and loads of stuff for free, which is really nice um, of you to do that. And it's it's gold dust. I've had a, a look at some stuff. I didn't know you had the community, so I'll check that out as well. Mm. Um, but if you send us the links and everything or whatever, whatever everything yeah. you kind of mentioned, we'll put that in the in the notes below so that everyone um can can go and find that. But in the meantime, thank you very yeah. much for episode one, Tom. It was a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. It was uh, it's a real honor to be on. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Okay, peeps, hope you enjoyed that episode. If you want to learn more about Tom, or you want to check out his business, all the links that he mentioned are in the description below. If you need some help with this stuff, obviously you can go to Tom. If you need it from a more safety, kind of human safety performance side of things, then 100% come and check us out as well, riskfluentltd.com. Drop me an email if you're not sure, and we'll be honest. If you think it's better to go to Tom, then we'll let you know. Um, we're not going to do something we can't do because it's not good for us. But drop me an email, James at riskfluentltd.com and um, hopefully we'll talk soon. Make sure you follow us and stuff as well, LinkedIn and we're not very good on Facebook and the other stuff, so probably just, probably just LinkedIn. Catch you next week. Safe. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host and its guests and do not necessarily reflect the position of the companies. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are examples only based on limited and dated open source information and should not be utilised in real life as the only solution available. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the companies. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic or otherwise, without prior written permission from James McPherson.